Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jania Stigall. I'm the manager of pre-college and pathway programs here at the Cleveland Institute of Music in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm so glad you could join us for the 2021 Building Bridges Symposium and our conversation this afternoon about building pathway programs to create diverse, equitable, and inclusive education opportunities for young musicians pursuing a career in classical music. Each of the sessions today and tomorrow will be recorded and shared in the weeks following the symposium in case you miss anything or in case you enjoyed a session so much you want to view it again. Over the next 75 minutes, I'm excited to moderate and participate in this conversation about building pathway programs. You'll hear from pathway program leaders from across the country about how their program started, lessons learned along the way, and advice for you about what type of program might be right for your organization and community. I'm so pleased to introduce today's panel, Adrian Thompson, Project Director at the Chicago Musical Pathways Initiative, from Peabody Conservatory's Tuned In Program and Baltimore Washington Musical Pathways, Elijah Wirth and Mateen Milan, and Kimberly McLemore, Vice President of Education and Community Engagement at the Nashville Symphony. Thank you all so much for being here. To provide context to today's conversation, I'd like to take a moment for each of our panelists to introduce their programs, to share who they are and where they're coming from for to our discussion today. First, I'd like to turn to Adrian in Chicago. Adrian, tell us about your program. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, I, I'll tell you a little bit about me. I have been around uh, Pathway program since 1998. Uh, as a parent and have had the opportunity to see my children attend uh, Curtis Manhattan School of Music, uh, New School Manus' Jazz and Contemporary Division. And I know exactly what went into, um, into those uh, successes. I am a retired orchestra teacher who taught African-American uh, students and watch them progress from level three to a level six orchestra in five years. I am, uh, have been a volunteer and have managed Pathways programs. And I also know what it's like to be discriminated against and to have limited exposure to information. The Chicago Musical Pathways program began in 2015. There was a convening in New York hosted by Mellon, where Charlie Grody from Merritt School of Music and Jim Hirsch, then of Chicago Sinfonietta, attended. And they thought, this is something that we can do. And in 2016, they went back to Chicago and started meeting with groups. In 2017, they received a planning grant and hired a project manager, which led to a proposal being written, submitted, and approved. And in 2019, I came to Chicago and did all of the things that are associated with a startup in order to uh, get the program going. And our first group of fellows were recruited and began the program in September of 2019. Um, next slide. Okay, and you will see the names of the people who were involved and stayed with uh, the conversations through that whole process. Uh, next slide, please. So what our program is like today is that we have had two graduating classes. Students have gone to Curtis, Manhattan, DePaul, Rice, San Francisco Conservatory, CIM, Oberlin, among other institutions, we have 93 fellows and their families, four full-time staff, task force committee, an advisory council, a marketing committee, a monthly newsletter, development activities to expand our uh, funding base, including an upcoming Juneteenth celebration, data evaluation firm to keep us accountable, 57 private teachers, 29 mentors, we had three, this year we had three orientation dates, five family meetings, 14 calendar uh, workshops and master classes, 
three college info sessions, 10 recitals, and the COVID bonus was that we were able to add 15 uh, additional workshops because people were available and it could be done remotely. And we are doing simultaneous Spanish translation of our meetings and we have a staff accompaniment. Uh, what's next is that next year, we will expect to be at a full complement of 130 students. We will have um, be fully staffed at 5.4 FTE, and we will be adding an SEL component next year after a successful pilot this year of a student advisory committee. Thank you. Wonderful, we can move on to CIM. Uh, next slide, slide, please. Yeah, so in 1920, as well. um, in 1920, CIM was founded with the vision of being a music school where every type of student could find opportunity for the best musical education. In 2016, as CIM was preparing for a new century of service to Cleveland and the classical music community, our president and CEO, Paul Hogel, who you hear from in the next session today, had just arrived at CIM and he launched a bold new vision of CIM being the future of classical music. A core part of this vision was a call to action for Cleveland, a city with a rich arts and culture community, to respond to the lack of diversity in the classical music field. Um, next slide, please. From those initial conversations in 2016, CIM engaged with community partners who shared this vision for a diverse and inclusive future of classical music and started planning a pilot program to serve Black and Latinx middle school and high school students in Cleveland. Leading up to the program launch in fall 2017, the 16-17 school year was spent securing funding, planning initial program design, recruiting, auditioning, and enrolling the first class of fellows. The CIM Musical Pathway Fellowship was launched with two fellows in the 17-18 school year. I joined as program manager in July 2019, just for year, before year three, and we just finished year four in 2021. We use a pilot model and it's grown consistently over time. In our first four years, the program has grown from two to five to eight to 12 fellows. And a really special part of this program in the CIM community is that we invest heavily in a small number of fellows. And this is just to ensure that they'll find success in our program and in their next steps in college or conservatory. The fellows receive a full scholarship to cover all areas of study at CIM prep. And our program design is modeled closely after the CIM undergraduate curriculum, including training in music theory, theorhythmics, and secondary piano. CIM MPF is part of the CIM prep and continuing education department. So our students have access to most CIM resources, for example, recording staff and the zero latency spaces that we have on campus came in really handy during the pandemic. And the program receives administrative staffing as a core CIM prep offering. So for example, admin support with recruitment and registration. And one special type of support, special type of support that we offer our students is mentorship by student leaders like the CM Black Student Union and the CM chapter standing up for racial justice. And this is just so the students feel more connected to this larger CM community. Uh, next slide, please. Our programs open to Black and Latinx middle school students in grades five through 12. And a unique component about our program structure is that we accept students who do not play orchestral instruments. So we accept boys, piano composition, and classical guitar as well. And essentially any area where we offer instruction in CIM prep. We had our first class of MPF graduates this spring and 100% were admitted into major music schools and conservatories. And if you stay tuned after today's session, you'll hear one of our fellows performing to close us out. MPF is generously, generously supported by the four funders listed here. And looking ahead, I'm really interested in learning from our graduate outcomes and stories about how we can be more effective and efficient moving forward, especially as we engage younger and younger students and with more time to be in the program and more time to prepare for college auditions. Um, with that, I'll pass the PowerPoint on to Kimberly in Nashville. Hi, everyone. It's great to, I can't see all of you, but it's great to be with all of you today. Um, we can advance to the next couple of slides, please. One more. 
Thank you so much. Um, the Nashville Symphonies of Cello Rondo Initiative it was designed and launched by my predecessor in Nashville, Walter Bittner, um, in 2015, kind of started that research and design um, process for the program. Um, it is also the same year that they secured funding from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Um, and then we started recruiting students in January 2016 um, with auditions and that first cohort starting in the school year, so the fall of 2016. I joined the Nashville Symphony in the um, winter of 2017, at kind of in the center, in the middle of that first cohort year, first year in the program. Um, and I started as the Accelerano manager managing that program full time. Um, and so I feel like I have had the privilege of seeing this program grow over the first six years. Um, I, I've also included our community partners who are a part of this um, design and um, research, and also the advisory committee during the first years of um, the Accelerando initiative. Um, next slide, please. We can advance the next slide, please. Thank you so much. There might be a lag. Um, the Accelerando program um, in, in the design phase decided that we really wanted to be representative of the demographics in the Nashville community. So um, our pathway program is open to any race ethnicity with the exception of um, Northeast Asian, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and or Caucasian students. Um, we have really large um, Middle Eastern, Egyptian, and Kurdish populations in Nashville, and we really wanted to make sure that um, our program was open to all underrepresented ethnicities and races in American orchestras. So these, this is our current um, racial ethnic breakdown of what the program looks like today. Um, the white sliver that you see there um, is worth noting that those students um, are Egyptian and identify as white. Um, I like to point that out because I don't want any misconceptions about the program and who is eligible. Um, we can advance to the next slide, please. Um, our, student, our students currently um, take part in activities that are pretty common amongst uh, other pathway programs in terms of lessons um, with our symphony musicians weekly. Um, they're attending classical concerts here at the Nashville Symphony with their families, attending master classes um, in a normal year monthly. We've been really excited this year, uh, silver lining to COVID. We've been able to offer um, 15 master classes this season, which was wonderful. Um, but their students are also attending summer festivals and um, getting mentorship through music theory, um, music history, other supplemental courses, in addition to mentorship throughout the college application audition process. Um, I thought it would be great to show you all of the wonderful festivals our students have been attending in recent years, in addition to the college and conservatory acceptances that we've received. We currently have 24 students um, in the program, and that ramped up from six in the, in the first cohort. And um, it's worth noting that even some of our former students that didn't end up graduating as alumni of the Accelerando program still went on to study music as um, music majors, um, whether or not they felt Accelerando was right for them. And um, we currently have students in the schools that include an asterisk. What's next for the Accelerando program? We are really excited that we just finished our first six years um, grant cycle with the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and were awarded an additional four year grant cycle um, with the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. We're thrilled to see this program grow to a full 10 years and the impact that we can make um, on longer term successes with our students and our alumni. Awesome, so we can move on to Baltimore. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Um, my name is Mateen and I'm representing Baltimore Pathways and tuned in with Eli. Um, so we can continue to the next slide, thank you. So similar to my colleagues on this panel, tuned in offers scholarship opportunities for students to both musically engage, but socially engage and even professionally as well. Um, we offer essentially a similar curriculum to what you might see in some of our other programs here on the panel with weekly lessons, theory, large and chamber ensemble, 
We also support summer learning opportunities and admission to concerts and other cultural events around Baltimore, but also regional and national. Um, we try and take a tour every two years to a different place, really give students a wider understanding of making music elsewhere. And we also offer classes in recording, production, improvisation, and jazz studies. The idea being that a student might take a private lesson and an ensemble class and also have the option to take an elective. Um, something interesting about our little vantage point is that um, we really work with our schools, both in the area, but we also work with our El Sistema program. And Eli will talk a little bit more about the El Sistema program in our area or kids. Um, and essentially my role is in my place in all of this is that I'm a new administrator with the program. I started in January in the middle of the pandemic. So as you can imagine, that's had its challenges, but also some successes as well. Um, I'm also an alumni of the program. So I was among the first cohort of this program when it started in 2007. Um, and I will say that just as a note, I'll be talking about the tuned in experience and how we founded our experience or our program in 2007. And I'll allude a little bit to our recognition as a pathway program as of last year. Um, but with that being said, we've been a pathway program for the past 10 years and have just really gotten this funding from the Mellon Foundation and been introduced to this cohort. So just to mention. Um, so in terms of initial conversations, our programming was kind of similarly formed in the way that Accelerando was, where we did research amongst the musical ecosystem in Baltimore. We talked to about 90 public schools and we talked to music educators in the area and in public schools and asking them about what they needed. How could we supplement their already going music programs? What more assistance could we do? Um, and they told us that you know private lessons, large ensemble opportunities, getting into the musical ecosystem was all things that they'd like us to do in terms of support. So we started to um, take that research back and we applied for funding through the Serdna Foundation in 2007. And they replied and said, hey, no, um, but we'd like you to possibly change your curriculum and actually start putting the research that you've gathered into practice. So that's kind of where the first cohort came to be. We decided to start putting that research that we'd done into practice and began with a cohort of about seven students. And we began with an initial budget of around, I'd say $50,000. And um, we really just tried to make robust programming happen from a very small budget point, very small salary points. Like the first salary allocation was about $15,000 within that first year. It was very small, but we tried to be very robust. In terms of our eligibility, um, like I said, we worked with smaller cohorts in the beginning. Our first initial cohort was a beginning number of six, and our admission was really based solely on locality, even though we served primarily African-American students, um, meaning that we didn't necessarily have any border in terms of race or um, certain financial background. We did check, but it's not like we were um, saying that some people couldn't get scholarship or an amount of scholarship instead of others. Generally, our financial assistance is applied broadly. So students will, if you're a part of the program, you won't have to pay for private lessons or large ensemble. Um, but of course, as students' needs changed individually, we're able to study that case by case and see what we can accommodate and try to accommodate as much as possible. Um, in terms of student successes, Thankfully, we've had some success. Nearly all of our students have graduated into two and four year colleges. We still assist those who have not matriculated into a college with professional opportunities, teaching artistry opportunities, and even continual academic opportunities. We've had some students attend Peabody, Juilliard, Oberlin, Yale, the Naval Academy, and we've had some alumni participate in major marketing campaigns for Calvin Klein, Prada, Saucony. So just really, really um, amazing artists. We're really, really grateful. Um, and in the curve in COVID, in our first year of Mellon funding, um, we've been able to do a couple things. Thankfully, we've been able to arrange for a collaboration with Peabody's dance department where we've composed our own music and dancers have choreographed their own dancing and we're putting it together for a film project that's just going to be coming out in the summer. Um, we've also been able to expand our curriculum and start serving students with a digital audio workspace course that's been really, really exciting. 
And um, we've been doing lecture series with our large ensemble conductors. In terms of what's coming next for us, we have our virtual summer program coming up that's going to be really, really fun. Um, and then we're gonna be releasing our work with the dance department and strengthening our partnership with the DC musical ecosystem now that we're a part of a part Pathways partnership together. All right, and I will bring it back to Jania. Awesome, thank you all so much. I'm so excited for today's conversation. So I'd love to start, go ahead and get started with a discussion. So what I love about our group here today is that we're all coming from really different cities with different cultures, different histories and different populations. So for all of the panelists here today, why was it important for your city and your community and your organizations to have a pathway program? I'll start with that one. Um, Nashville is Music City and we really needed the students in this population to be supported um, and be fostered into professional music careers. So, um, and I mentioned this a little bit in my introduction, but um, in kind of the planning process for the Accelerando program, um, you know, we were simultaneously as an institution starting to think about our equity, diversity, and inclusion work and how that was um, really important to fit in our strategic plan moving forward. And um, so we felt it was really important that this pathway program and, um, be really reflective of not only our strategic plan and equity diversity work, but also the city of Nashville. So we we chose um, to kind of alter a little bit of the, the model we went on, which was Atlanta's talent development program, um, which serves just black and Latinx students um, to also include other demographics. Um, so that's that's something that was unique to Nashville for the Accelerando Initiative. I can follow up um, something that I think was really paramount to us beginning our Pathways program in Baltimore was two things. And that was the clear difference in educational opportunities depending on socioeconomic background in Baltimore. So students from one neighborhood could just have a much quality or say from a certain academic, a socioeconomic background could just have a better quality of education than say most of our Baltimore residents. So it became really, really clear to us that we needed to offer opportunities that would just circle around equity. Um, and then that there was not necessarily a clear pathway from elementary school music education to conservatory in Baltimore. The only link that one would have to that was say like a Baltimore School for the Arts, arts-based high school that would give you that training for free and allow you to pursue a musical education in college. But if you weren't able to make the educational needs that were able to happen so that you could get into that school, you weren't necessarily in luck. So we really had to find a way to meet that gap and prepare students as well as we could for even just that high school level before getting to the collegiate level. One of the things that was important in Chicago is that we wanted things to start happening on purpose rather than happening by accident. So it's like, if you have the right exposure then and the desire, then you continued on in the path. And if you persisted and persevered, you may um, be successful. But there were also others that had that desire, but they did not have the opportunity or exposure to develop themselves to their fullest potential. So by pulling things together in one place, we are able to provide them all of the components that they need in addition to the instruction, the exposure to artists in the field, a mentor who is providing education about how to kind of navigate the industry. And it just adds a, another layer. We have many organizations in Chicago that are doing music instruction, but for those who really want to do it at the elite level, we are now able to offer an elite program that helps them get that little bit of edge so that they can continue on their journey. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Like what I love about having conversations with other pathway programs is how 
our programs are similar in some ways, but because of where we are, like there's so many unique things that we can all offer. So I wanna shift the conversation a bit to talk about partnerships. And I wanna send this to Baltimore and also Chicago. So how did the initial partners for your programs come together to get started? And how did you engage new partners over time? And I'll start with you, Adrian. So I think that it was kind of, there's a robust community here. And so people knew each other, they were talking to each other. And so they started inviting organizations to have conversations about this specific topic. And so for some organizations, it was a very good fit. And so they continued the conversation uh, because it happened over, over time. You know, it, it took, probably two or three years from the initial thought until it actually uh, became a reality. And so part of it was just who stuck all the way through all of the stuff because you're running other organizations. And this was kind of something that started out on the side. And it was as people started to really organizations that gravitated toward the conversation or even were very instrumental in the beginning and helping to recruit. It's like, stick around, stay with us, help us. And I guess I want to mention that it starts out kind of as a mess, okay? If I can use that term until it just, through additional conversation, it just starts to coalesce into, into what it will be. So please don't get discouraged in the beginning if you don't feel like everybody is on the same page. It, takes, it take, may take a while, but it will happen. So <clears throat> in Baltimore, we at Peabody, we started our program around the same time as the, the Baltimore Symphony was starting the ORCIDS program. And so we wanted to make sure that we weren't chosen that the two programs were going to complement each other. The BSO's program is a residency program in the different communities in Baltimore where we try to bring kids to Peabody. So they started very young and we're really getting their hands dirty in the communities where we were looking for older kids that we could polish and get into some of the elite music schools. So we were, the two programs are really designed to complement each other. And that was something we had to really make sure um, we sort of stayed in the, in the right lane. And then on top of that, as Mateen mentioned, we have the Baltimore School for the Arts which had been doing this work in Baltimore for 20 years or so, 30 years, by the time the BSO and, and Peabody were starting their programs. So we had to make sure that we were playing nice in the sandbox with them because Baltimore being a, a relatively small city, there's not a lot of funding sources. So there was a little of um, animosity, I'd say, between the organizations over fighting over who was going to apply for what and trying to to make sure that all of the groups stayed healthy financially. So trying to make that uh, partnership with the other groups to make sure that we weren't stepping on each other's toes, both programmatically and with, with funding was, was very important in the initial development of the programs. Um, and we're also looking forward to, to developing the pathway to DC with the Kennedy Center and a lot of the organizations down there to, to make our, um, you know, the Mellon pathway more robust as well. Awesome. Thank you all so much for these responses. It's always exciting to hear about partnerships in the community because I think it's a sign of support and like buy-in from, from like where you are. So I want to shift the conversation again a little bit. So of our group, we have programs hosted by music schools and symphony orchestras. And so again, for the group, um, what have been some of the benefits and challenges of working within your type of host organization? I can jump in again. Um, working under Johns Hopkins University and having their development department, which is, I don't know how many hundreds of people work in that department, but being able to rely on that to raise money has been amazing. Now, at the same time, the amount of red tape that we have to go through to do anything in an in a organization as big as Johns Hopkins is, is mind-numbingly frustrating. So 
just because we have so many, you know, it's such a big organization. There's so many people that can help when we need something. That's great. But there is, you know, paperwork we have to fill out and triplicate to do absolutely anything at any time. So those having having a bigger organization is great, but it also has its, you know, the red tape can be very challenging. Yes, just to chime in a bit about the higher ed space, like I think just those resources, conservatory resources have come in really handy, especially over the pandemic, that anything that we provide to our conservatory students that our pathway fellows have access to as well, like equipment, recording services, zero latency spaces. But I'd love to hear from Kimberly as well as representing symphony orchestras. I think, um, I think I'm going to agree with um, Elijah there that there's pros and cons to any organization that sponsors um, the pathway programs. And I think uh, something that makes our program unique being part of a symphony orchestra is we are, we're, we're small staff. So it's essentially myself and our HLR under coordinator, Bryce and Finney managing the program. So decision-making is a pretty streamlined process and doesn't take too long. Um, but the flip side of that is I, I was like listening to Adrian's wonderful staff that she was talking about. And I was like, oh, how one, like that must be so nice. Um, so, I mean, there, is, there are good and bad things to having um, different size staff and different size organizations, but I would say that one of the benefits of being a part of a symphony orchestra is that, you know, my faculty is right downstairs three days a week in a normal year, um, not this year, um, but most of the time if I need to speak with them or, hey, how's your student doing or, oh, let's catch up about this, I can just pop downstairs before or after a rehearsal and things get done so quickly um, when I can do that. Um, I would say the the downside to a symphony orchestra is that you are dealing with a musician's contract um, and a CBA and what all that means for our faculty members. Um, so that's that's a challenge to navigate at times. Um, but I I think it it really just depends on um, how committed your musicians and your faculty and your staff are towards the success of of, of a pathway program on whether or not it'll work well for your institution. Being part of a community music school is wonderful because all they do is teach um, music. And so therefore there are no conflicts of interest. Having uh, partners um, are wonderful. We get a chance to go to Chicago Symphony concerts and Chicago Symphonietta concerts. Um, so, this is really a, a wonderful place, um, you know, to host a program like CMPI and um, has been very well supported in the community, the Chicago community. Great. Now I want to talk a bit about program design. So I know there's like a lot of overlap within all of our programs of what we offer mostly lessons and support for college auditions. But I, beyond that, I know there's like a lot of diversity in the curriculum and program design. So I wanted to ask the panelists again, um, how did you decide what to offer students through your program and why was and why were those offerings important for your program? So I'd like to come back to Kimberly first on this question. I think like in the initial program design phase, um, we were trying to strike a balance between how much can we offer these students? What exposure can we give these students? How many resources can we give these students and experiences prior to graduating college that can actually be executed and like reasonably mm -hmm. every week? Um, there are only so many hours in the week and our students are often the students that are high achieving in school um, and also participate in other activities. So it was really trying to strike a balance between preparing them the way they needed to be prepared prior to college and making sure that we weren't overwhelming them um, with what the program offered. So yes, the lessons in youth orchestra and music theory, um, and our students have the option once they finish the music theory curriculum to take other supplementary courses like music history or oral skills or class piano, um, but we, we prioritize that music theory first. Um, and, and so really in terms of the scheduling where there's the most leeway are those master classes and other performance opportunities for our students. Um, 
So just being able to strike a balance between what is the right number and frequency of master classes, what is the right um, requirements to like how many students are we requiring to be there in attendance, and then um, you know all striking that same kind of balance with how often the students are performing and in what venues in what way. I can jump in. Um, Peabody's preparatory division, I believe, started in the 1890s. So when we started our program, we had a good 100 plus years of, of curriculum already in place there, which was good and bad because we had, you know, ensembles, all the traditional stuff, private lessons, group classes, things like that. But um, we needed stuff that was going to particularly engage our kids. Uh, we had kids that were really into New Orleans brass band music. So we started New Orleans brass band. Uh, we have kids that are really into the, the production end of music. So we started music production classes. Um, we really made our improvisation offerings more robust because we have tons of kids that are into jazz. Uh, about five or six years ago, we went into a big study of African-American and female composers. And we, we did a whole recording project two years ago where we recorded um, Joplin's Overture to Tree Manisha, a bunch of works by James Reese Europe and W.C. Handy. So it was making the curriculum really work for, for our population and not really try to fit them into that 100-year-old curriculum. So I guess what we did was kind of just look at if there were um, musicians who were part of an orchestra who were BIPOC musicians, then trying to figure out what they did, the reason why they ended up in that place. Um, so I think more than anything, kind of doing some observation of people who were getting into certain schools or landing certain jobs and trying to determine what the commonalities were in their experience and then trying to standardize that and systemize that so that every student in our program had the chance uh, for the same opportunities. So uh, for instance, uh, Joe Conyers got into Curtis, and he grew. He was in Savannah. I was in Atlanta, so we really didn't know each other. But he got an email from me at Curtis, trying to figure out, you know, what is it that, you know, how did you get up there? And um, because we want to do exactly what you did, so I think that was probably kind of taking what was happening and turning it into a system or a process and then finding by going through that process um, that you could create the same kind of outcomes for every child that was willing to do the work. That's so beautiful. Yeah, that's something that I definitely learned from my first two years of uh, working in pathway programs is that there are systems and their processes that work and have worked in other parts of the country. And it's just, it's really great to connect with other people to learn more about what's working for them. So as we're talking about building programs that are making a meaningful impact in our communities and organizations, like this is something that was mentioned earlier, it's so important to have the right people involved. So Mateen, I know you're new in your role in Baltimore and Adrian, you're leading a relatively new team in Chicago. So for both of you, how did your programs build your teams and staff? And I'd like to start with Mateen on this one. Thanks, Jania. So I'll talk a little bit about the experience that I had coming in as an administrator, and then I'll talk about the early stages of Tuned In. So as an administrator, um, we were able to acquire this funding to better support the actual Pathways Scholarship that we started last year. And with that came the idea that we would need somebody on the ground to really facilitate relationships with families and really um, assist students with matriculation. So it's been really like an excellent process of just becoming a part of the community again, because I was already present, not only as an alumni, but as a teaching artist. And especially in the pandemic, the fear was that I'd be 
coming into this role, but not necessarily really being able to connect with families and teachers and who I needed to because we were all in this kind of separated space. So I'm really grateful that I kind of already knew the ecosystem that I was entering. Um, and then I was just able to find how my work complemented the community that I knew. Um, and then bridge more community and kind of get to know the the, the inner workings of, of what I've experienced for the past few years. So that has been interesting. Um, and then I just want to talk a little bit about the beginning. So we were lucky enough to be a part of an institution where there were already teaching artists available. There didn't necessarily need to be this buy-in from, say, a reluctant orchestral musician that liked the cause but didn't necessarily want to do the work. Um, teaching artists were already committed to being avid teachers. So we used those teachers at Peabody um, in those initial years, like with our um, flute students and our clarinet students, there was already somebody there to assist us with that work. When we actually started to grow in larger numbers, instruments became more diverse, our offerings became more diverse, we really started to pick and choose who we needed in certain roles to assist our students. So, and then we really changed our programming depending on if students wanted to do a certain thing. So in my example, I started bassoon at Tuned In. Um, and that was a question of me asking like, hey, I'd like to play the bassoon. So they went and found a bassoon. They went and found a teaching artist that would complement what I needed rather than um, us just trying to funnel somebody into a situation that was already kind of happening. So. I hope that answered your question. This work finds you. So it's, um, if you are looking for a job, this is not the right place for you. So it is something that is more of a mission. And I really believe that if you have you know, interest in doing this kind of thing, it selects you and you find where your place is to be within, um, within, the, within the quest. I don't know, there may be a better word for it, but it's like people who are sharing, all of us who are musicians are musicians because someone spent some time with us helping us to learn and to love uh, this craft. And so we have an opportunity now to do the same thing for uh, other, other people. And in and of itself, it can be some of the most rewarding work you can do as you start to see a child grow as you start to see them kind of gain confidence, as you see them how to build, you know, each success is a stepping stone to another success. And it's a lot of work. And so if you're looking for a job, this is, there are so many easier ways to make money that you need to be uh, selected, you know, like uh, a mission. And they are teenagers. And so in the course of helping to guide them through what is already difficult to be a teenager and adolescence and coming of age, it's like there's gonna be some bumps in the roads and you have to be able to kind of keep uh, an idea on the long-term. And you also, I think, have to be in a position where you are continuing to be observant. So you know that the kids are working with the right teachers. Um, you are aware when it may, might be time for them to start working with a different teacher. You are uh, you know, monitoring those relationships and making sure that the, you know, the teachers haven't gotten to a place where, where their view is limited rather than expansive of what the child can, can achieve. So. It's something that continues to evolve because the children continue to evolve. And we have to always be uh, mindful that we are meeting what their needs are at the time, not necessarily what it was last year or what it will be next year, but their needs at the time so that they will be ready to go to the next, the next phase. 
Yes, I agree 200%. It definitely is a calling. So I wanted to I wanted to go back to something else that was mentioned a little earlier when we were all sharing about our programs. So all of our programs share like a common mission of serving students with a long term goal of increasing diversity in the field. So within that larger mission, how did your programs decide who to serve through your programs and what have been some of the benefits and challenges of your eligibility requirements. And just to chime in first, um, something that is really awesome about CIM is that we are open to non-orchestral instruments, but an occasional challenge is that, like for example, if we have one voice student or one classical guitar, the lack of cohort with, with some of the other areas where we typically recruit more students like strings. But I'd love to hear from the panel as well about what have been some of the benefits and challenges of how you define your eligibility requirements for your program. I can jump in um, with with the tuned in program. We purposely made the eligibility requirements very vague, so we could take who we wanted to. Um, but that was mostly so we could get the boat in the water, and we knew we, we were building a program. And we also knew that winds, brass, and percussion at Peabody was incredibly underserved in general. There was tons of uh, tons of strings, tons of piano, but the wind, brass, and percussion end of things that we were initially building the program from wasn't happening. So we didn't want to make our eligibility too narrow because we knew if we wanted to build wind ensembles, we needed X amount of people to build a wind ensemble, and we couldn't be that that picky. We had to take a French horn player, regardless of what they looked like or or how much money you know mom and dad made. So to get the program going, we were purposely not very picky. It's gotten a little bit more strict as we've gone along, but in the beginning, so we could get going, we, we did not, we purposely did not define it. I can say that I think um, Mellon had a very instrumental role in helping to define who the program, who is eligible for the program and that definition in, in Chicago and that definition is very uh, inclusive in terms of being able to include a, right, a wide range of, of students who can be part of the program and benefit from it echo what Adrian said in terms of um, the, the students we were targeting with this program and who was eligible, but kind of a, a challenge um, with the, the eligibility requirements that we did select was just the um, community education and uh, around what this program was intended for, and this kind of goes for any program that you're starting, not just a pathway program, but um, just informing the community, this is what our goal is, this is the mission of this program. There are other musical opportunities for students that don't meet our eligibility requirements in these areas of our city and in these organizations, but this program is intended for these students in this way for this reason. Um, and so I think there that is always a bit of a curve too when starting a new program just because, um, you know, I mean, we got nasty emails saying, oh, you're discriminating against my child. And I think there's just education around um, talking with those people and telling them why this program is needed and why um, the institution is prioritizing it. So um, I, I did just want to voice that for people considering starting a new program. So on the topic of students, I'd love to hear from the panel on how you recruited those first students that join your program and what's been helpful for you um, as you continue engaging new students. Um, I would love to, to jump in on this just because of our first class was a woodwind trio with a, a very, what, like 11 year old Mateen Milan in it. And now I'm, I'm sharing this, this presentation with him in the, the same month that he's graduating Yale with his master's degree. So that's, this is a really cool, like for a full circle experience for me. Um, it was, it was all about area music teachers for us and going to the, 
the elementary and middle schools and, and finding them and making sure that, I mean, I saw a, a note in the chat about uh, outreach to elementary school students. With the elementary school age, for us, it's been all about interviewing mom and dad and making sure that mom and dad are, are bought in. With the high school kids, you, you can target the kid a little bit more, but with that age, you need the, the family to be 100% behind the situation if it's gonna succeed. So it's been really more about looking at the whole picture and making sure that you have a parent that's going to get the kid there and keep them engaged in, in the, the situation. For us, we were also, and still do, look for students who were already doing all the things. Who are the students that are, you know, already doing the regional honor bands and orchestras that I can snag after a performance and be like, hey, do you take private lessons? Let me tell you about this program. Um, you know, and um, in addition to those relationships with teachers, mm -hmm. the, the students that you see in your community who are really driven to do those things and those activities on their own and might just not have the guidance or mentorship or structure in place to know how to guide that musical journey towards college um, that you know, Accelerando is not a wide reaching program. We only have 24 students. Um, so we really wanna make sure that all 24 are the right student. So um, I, I would say that we do a lot of, of interviewing and auditioning, like it's a long audition process because we really want to find the right kid. Um, but I, I would say in addition to those relationships with educators, find the students that are already motivated on their own and then just like give them the fuel to their fire to go towards college and conservatory. It's, it's in some ways um, in my mind, low hanging fruit because these kids, they, they might have been successful on their own, but we, but if you can help guide them at all through the program, like how much farther along their journey will, you, will they be? So um, that's something to consider. It's also like a, a balance between some of our programs are um, based on socioeconomic status and others are not. So that's something to also consider um, is where are you finding these students through the school system or through other, local I mean I don't I don't want to advocate for like poaching students that's the wrong way to say this but other students who are a part of community music schools that maybe um aren't getting the full gamut of instruction that a pathway program could offer like it's worth discussing the program with those students as well don't poach students I feel like I just said that but don't do that You heard it from Kimberly, don't, don't do that. <laughs> awesome, so thank you all so much for your conversations and insights today. So as the last question before we move on to audience q and I wanted to ask about that transition from a program on paper and a proposal to like a living, breathing program in your community. So what are some of the challenges that you faced in the very early days of your programs and what advice would you offer to program managers that might be in a similar situation today? I think you have to already know what you want. So the concept needs to be fully fleshed out in your mind. And so therefore your biggest challenge is just communicating what's in your head to other people. You have to be really careful about not knowing exactly what it is that you're trying to achieve and then trying to figure it out as you go, it's much better to know exactly what you want because people will not always understand this program and how it may be different from other opportunities. And because there is a process that will help you get students from A to B, if you know what that is, then you can do that and you can apply it to each student, even though you're applying it to the student individually, you're doing the same thing. The biggest danger is not knowing what you want because then you start hearing all of these competing voices around you that would tell you you should be doing this or you should be doing that. And usually the people that is 
giving you the advice the loudest. Uh, they're not they're not experts. They're not musicians. They aren't involved in the education of children. And so it's like if you can remain steadfast because you know what it is that you're trying to achieve and you just go and quietly do that work, eventually everybody starts to understand, oh, okay, I get it now. So your biggest problem is communicating what's in your head, but not actually creating what's in your head, if that makes any, any sense. So, um, so that's the biggest thing. Don't, don't doubt the process. Realize that it takes a while for it to kick in, both with kids and families and sometimes other members of the community, but just stay on that path until you can start to see the uh, fruit that you are, you know, that is going to be yielded. And then you have the proof to all of the people that told you you aren't doing it right, do it this way. You have the proof to show them no, this works. I would say, and this somewhat just is an extension of what Adrian said, but something that has um, kept me really grounded and focused in this work is that every decision I make needs to be student-centered and what is in the best interest of the student and their musical journey, um, because there are a lot of competing forces um, in your organization. It might be the board or it might be your faculty or it might be parents or it might be the community members. Um, but but if you make your decisions that it are always in the best interest of the student, I, I think you will like maintain that steady path towards um, success. I would also say that if you're considering starting a pathway program, you should call Adrienne Thompson and become her best friend and um, pick her brain and hear what she has to say about every situation and any problem I have encountered um, as a program manager. Adrian always had advice for me. And um, so she is a wonderful mentor to get to know and um, just take her to dinner and pick her brain. <laughs> Yes, I second that. I second that. <laughs> Everybody ate by Adrian dinner. And I'd love to hear from Baltimore on this one as well. I think one of the challenges that I've seen so far in terms of going from the actual paper to programming has been the idea that while we do want to have an idea of what it is we want to implement in the community and how we want to support our students, we have to remain flexible, like Kimberly was saying, and really support our youth with what the youth are giving back to us, what feedback we're receiving from the youth. Um, I think it's been just a really interesting time being in the pandemic and having to listen to what the youth are saying, what works and what does not, and then thinking about what's on paper and you know, thinking about if we need to change our narrative in some way, if we need to start thinking about like what offerings we're doing and how we're offering them. The idea being that youth will most likely tell you what they like and what they don't like. Um, and it's just our, our job to be receptive to that and to be flexible to what's going to keep them engaged and what's going to make them feel nurtured in the space. Yes, I agree 100%. We have time for questions from our audience. If you have any questions for us, if you would put those in the Q&A function. I see one in there already that's a really great question from Maureen. So question for the panel. What, if any, level of parent guardian involvement is required in your programs, and how do you navigate transportation barriers, again, if any? I can say from Baltimore that we don't require involvement, but welcome it. Um, we don't want um, the ability of the parent to be involved to affect whether how, how we can help the, the student. Uh, so we don't require it, but we have. Um, we have a lot that are very involved, and we have a, we have a shuttle. We have a, um, it's part of our budget to have a, a shuttle that goes and pick goes into certain neighborhoods and, and picks kids up. And it is um, okay. Let's put it that way. It's it's part of the, the JHU sort of shuttle system, and it it is a good. It's better than nothing. Let's put it that way. 
sorry if there's some construction in my background, but I will also say that we've done the dirty work of like even buying Ubers for students and getting them to rehearsals, filming days, things of that nature, just to make sure that they're able to be a part of programming. Um, and we just try and keep an open line of communication. Like even last Saturday, we had a physical um, programming event and a student texted me saying, I need help with transportation. And it was no problem. Like I'll figure out how to get reimbursed for it later. But the attendance, if the student wants to be there, then we'll find a way. We've always um, required it because we view what we're doing as only the first part of their journey, just to get them through high school and through college. And I know that um, I know that when they get to college, that if they don't have the support of their family, they're not going to be able to do this for the long haul. They will not be able to pers persevere long enough to get finished with all of their training and all of. Um, um, you know, they're auditioning because when they first get out of school, they are not necessarily going to walk into a job the same way if they had gotten an engineering degree. So for us, we know right from the beginning if the parent is going to be involved. And part of what we do is to try to help the parents to learn more about the classical music industry so that they can provide that kind of support. So we do not, or once we get an application, the child cannot get an audition appointment without the child and at least one parent coming to an information session. So that's how we kind of set the tone at the very beginning. The child cannot audition unless we have actually, in normal times, but still we did it remotely. We have actually laid eyes that there is a parent that is willing to uh, support them. And then that continues in terms of, um, you know, there are certain family meetings, a parent has to be there. The mentor reaches out to the parent also. So it's also a learning process for the parents so that by the time their child gets through the program, they know exactly what kind of support their child is gonna need in order to you know, stay in school, to graduate and, and to continue because they've been part of providing uh, teaching and education and exposure for them also. So when we get tickets to concerts, the parents are the ones that um, also have tickets. They take them to the concerts. We aren't picking kids up and going to the concerts as a student group. They're going to a concert as a family group so that they can become more exposed. We're very similar to what Adrian just described and that we we require parental involvement or guardian involvement throughout the application audition process for the program and at kind of a key milestones so there has to be a parent or guardian present at every semester advisory meeting um, that said even with our students having very involved parents and guardians, um, it doesn't eliminate all transportation issues for our students um, and I will say that the biggest thing that has helped that in our program is the sense of community amongst our students and our parents because these are their people. Um, they're just like them and so they see them throughout the year and they get to know them and they become really wonderful friends, not just the students but their parents as well. And so what tends to happen is if there's a student that has a transportation issue, they can be like, hey, I'm coming. I'm coming from Sperna too. I'm gonna pick you up on the way. Um, and we kind of have a system where students are able to like put it out to all the Chelorando students and parents. I'm having trouble getting a ride. Can anyone help me out? And it's, it's just, it, it's, a, it's a larger village for these students. So the, I would encourage you to build great community with your students and your parents so that our parent, your parents trust each other to drive their student and or child somewhere for the program. Great, thank you all so much. Our next question is from John Meldrum from Zap Music in Paris. How is it going with your outreach to elementary school students to introduce them to classical music 
and perhaps incite them to start taking lessons? And also, are there programs for young singers? So I have a program for young singers. If you're in fifth grade, you can study in the CIM MPF program. But I'd love to hear from, from the panel as well about um, this question from John. I'll take this one. So um, one benefit of working at a symphony orchestra is that we also have other education and outreach programming that can then um, help feed the Accelerando program. Um, so a lot of our other education and outreach initiatives in the community, including elementary outreach, um, then can help foster some relationships in the community, whether that's through teachers, parents, students, kind of identifying those students at a young age. I will say we are such a young program that we have not seen elementary students then come up and really attribute our community engagement to their participation in a cello rondo. But um, also like I view that other symphony education programming as really vital to kind of the landscape that a cello rondo is recruiting in. So um, I think they're connected in a lot of ways. Um, we do a lot of the, sectional ensemble work with elementary um, music students but um you know oddly enough nashville for being music city has um really under supported string programs um in the city and so we have really kind of boosted our efforts to support those um those programs throughout middle tennessee but specifically um davidson county that we are in in metro nashville um and bless that our school district just started three elementary string programs during a pandemic so we are doing everything we can to support those programs um and sending our musicians to work with those students to, to one day maybe see them in the accelerando program Um, I could say as far, as far as singers go at Peabody, we've had several students that we've started on instruments and it became obvious that they weren't feeling that situation. Um, and then we've switched them over to voice lessons because it seemed like that that was a more appropriate direction for them. We haven't brought anybody in to be um, a vocalist. It's always been something that, you know, the clarinet didn't work out. So we're, we're giving them an opportunity to sing. Um, and to go through the vocal program that's already existing at Peabody. Awesome. So for our next question, this is from Canton Symphony Orchestra. How do you evaluate your programs to make sure you are serving the needs that exist in a changing community? And how, how, how do you add to, and how do you add or subtract from what you do to use your resources wisely? I'll take it. Um, program evaluation is something we're kind of doing constantly, um, just in terms of like feedback from students and faculty and parents and all of that. Um, but I would say I'm not going to speak fully about program evaluation because I think there's a whole session on it, so you should go. Um, but what I will say is if you are managing or considering managing um, a pathway program is to keep all the notes, keep all the data. Um, everything is data for this program. And um, I, I mean, I can tell you like how much scholarship dollars our students are receiving when they graduate based on how much investment we put in these students and I can also tell you the last time they missed a lesson. So um, no piece of information is too small to track um, in, in my mind in terms of helping that larger evaluation piece that you'll hear much more in depth conversation about in a different session. I think you have to be careful to make sure that you are always looking kind of at the long term view. So the mission of our program is to get kids in the um, best schools that they can audition into and for them to audition well enough that they earn enough scholarship money that it is affordable for their families for them to attend. And so you can come in the program as young as, as sixth grade, but where you really get a chance to measure the effectiveness of what has happened is what happens to your seniors. Are your seniors achieving that goal? Because you are sometimes going to have 
some ups and downs along the way. As I mentioned earlier, they are te teenagers. And so therefore you have to make sure that you don't revamp something. Um, you don't revamp something based on a small situation that then skews you away from what the long-term um, mission is. So the other thing that I also think about teenagers is that uh, they don't know their heads from a hole in the ground. And so therefore you have to be real careful about letting them set the agenda because they may not necessarily have a long-term view and they can give you an expert rationale why they should not have to write a concert report or something like that, but yet you know that they will become a better musician if they learn how to listen to and write about music. So we have to be careful of sometimes doing something short-term that may please someone when we have to keep our eye on where we're trying to lead them over the long term. I can say for me, the, the, the data that trumps everything is attendance. If they're showing up, you know you're doing something right, regardless of what that is that you're doing. If they're showing up and they're happy and the, and, and the, the families are coming to the performances and they're engaged, that, that's the ultimate thing that you have to measure beyond you know any financial or, or or whatever is are the kids showing up and if that if that isn't happening as consistently as you needed to be there's there's your smoke to go put a fire out because that's just gonna it's just gonna get worse from there so it's really all about attendance i think in in getting getting these things good and off the ground Awesome. Thank you all so much to the audience for all these questions and to the panel for your answers. So we've come to the end of our time. So I wanted to end today's panel with a few words of inspiration to all the Pathway Program Managers listening today. So to the panel, what's one piece of advice you'd offer to current or soon to be Pathway Program Managers to encourage them to keep going? And I'd like to start with Mateen. Thanks. Um, it's been great to speak to you all. It's been great to be on this panel and like literally honored to be speaking with Adrian and Judea and Eli. It's really been a pleasure. One thing I'll say that has been incredibly helpful to me is what Adrian spoke about earlier in this, um, in this discussion, which is if this work is really for you, it's really for you. Um, if this is something that is really calling you and you see that there is a need in your community and that you will work tirelessly to fill it, maybe not tirelessly, if you work in a healthy way to, <laughs> if you work in a healthy way to fulfill the needs in the community, then do that. And um, I spoke to Eli about this earlier. If the grant funding changes and you're worried that you're going to be able to continue, don't necessarily be afraid. Like keep working what you feel like is really supportive to your community and try and find partners that are really seeing eye to eye with your vision. Um, and don't be afraid if those things change. Like there's been times where we've had to, you know, change who funds our programs and how we look at those partners. And it's just been a, an ongoing conversation that will continue to happen, has happened. So be ready for the, the hoops and hurdles and um, know your community and listen to your community. That's all I got. Eli? Um, beg for forgiveness, don't ask for permission. That's it. Kimberly? I would say, I would kind of echo something I said earlier, just stay very student-centered in all of your decision-making and keep them front of mind in how you design, implement, begin, continue um, a pathway program. And um, I, think, I think you will find your way where you need to go. And last but not least, Adrian. Um, as an orchestra teacher, I was always the only orchestra teacher in the building. So if I wanted to have the opportunity to talk to somebody who really understood what I was going to, I had to find another orchestra teacher in another building in order to have that conversation. 
So I would encourage people not to work in isolation. There are people who may not be right there in your building, but there are programs across the country. It is a very vibrant community. So don't feel like you have to work in isolation. Just reach out. Any of us would love to talk about what we do and, and just reach out so that you can feel supported as you are doing the work. Wonderful. So thank you so much to Adrian, Kimberly, Eli, and Mateen for your thoughts and for your insights today. And thank you so much to our audience for joining and for all of your questions. I hope you'll stay tuned for our next Building Bridges Symposium session beginning at 3 o'clock Eastern on Funding Pathway Programs. But before you go, to close out our session, please stay tuned for this performance from Davian Goggins playing Via Lobos Prelude Number 1. Damien is a class of 2021 graduate of the Cleveland Institute of Music's Musical Pathway Fellowship Program and will be attending Oberlin Conservatory this fall. Thank you so much again for joining and we'll see you next time.